Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that wonderful testimony. That's great, isn't it? Fantastic to be a part of, of uh, God's work. I am glad that we didn't have a sign up this morning when you came in. And I am thankful that no one sat down at my dinner table here because when Jonathan and Melissa put it together, Jonathan informed me this is their lunch today. So after the service, we are going to ask you to not touch their food, okay? Uh, and we hope that the chicken stays uh, at least edible before today. But um, on your journey, did anyone ever ask you a question? If you could have dinner with any person in the world, who would it be? If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would it be? Let's hear your answers. J.J. Watt? disease a lot of times the person would be really swollen and noticeably swollen because of this and so you have Jesus at the house of a Pharisee he's been invited to dine with a Pharisee now if you don't know who the Pharisees are they are really the religious and political leaders of the day for the Jews now in this time the custom was you don't just crash parties there were no wedding crashers there were no party crashers you didn't go into someone's house and eat at that table unless you had been invited in by the host and so the Pharisees they put together this dinner and they invite Jesus to come but did you notice at the end of verse 1 what it said that they were doing when Jesus was there they were watching him and they were watching him carefully and then verse 2 tells us that there's this man that has this obvious disease and he has been invited to the party by the Pharisees now the reason this is really weird is because the Pharisees, being religious and political leaders, they, they would never have invited someone like this to come to their party. And the reason why was because people at that time, the Pharisees had taught people that if you had some kind of disease like leprosy or dropsy or there were paralytics, paralyzed people, you would never be invited to a, the house of a Pharisee because they taught that you had that disease because you were cursed by God. And so these people that were blind and that were paralyzed, that couldn't walk, the crippled, all these people would never have been invited to the party. But we find this contrast where Jesus has been invited to the house of Pharisees, who, by the way, did not like Jesus. And they've invited this man in verse 2 to come to the party. And at the end of verse 1, sandwiched in between Jesus sitting down for dinner and this man being mentioned, you have this phrase that, that Luke describes. He describes the Pharisees in this way. They are watching Jesus carefully. 
Now in verse 1, you'll also notice that it was the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees and religious leaders, the Bible had been clear in Exodus chapter 20, and it'll be up on the screen for you if you want to read along as I'm talking. But the Sabbath day to the Jewish people was a holy day. When God gave His law to the Jewish people, He said, remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Six days you're to do your work, and on the seventh day you're to rest. And that was because God created everything that is in six days, and on the seventh day He rested. And the Pharisees took that law that you couldn't work on the Sabbath day, and here's what they did, and this is what religion always does. They take the Word of God and then they change it. And so they would say things like this, if you have a hair on your head that you want to pull, you can't pull that hair on your head because that would be working on the Sabbath. Now is that what God said when He said to rest on the Sabbath day? Did He say anything about the hairs on your head? But what the Pharisees did is they they formed this entire book of laws, hundreds of them saying you could not do these certain things on the Sabbath day because in their mind it would constitute work. So you you have the Sabbath day, you have a party going on at the Pharisee's house, you have Jesus invited and the Pharisees are watching him carefully and all of a sudden this man with a, a disability is brought before Jesus. And here's the dilemma. If Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath day, then the Pharisees thought, we've got him breaking the law because he's working on the Sabbath. But then if Jesus doesn't heal him, then Jesus doesn't have compassion on people. So they're watching Jesus. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to trap him. They bring this man in front of him and they present this dilemma before Jesus. But notice how Jesus responds beginning in verse 3. Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then He took Him and healed Him and sent Him away. And He said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. I love Jesus' response. Hey guys, since you're trying to trap me here, by the way, I know your heart. You tell me, is it wrong for me to heal this guy on the Sabbath day? And they're looking around like, I don't know. What's he talking about? But you know in their minds, that's what they were trying to do. And Jesus then heals this man. And then he tells them, if you had an ox or your son fell in the ditch on the Sabbath day, are you telling me that you would not pull him out of the ditch? And of course, the answer is obvious, right? Well, of course you would. And Jesus was simply saying this, the kingdom that He came to bring, the kingdom of heaven is God bringing healing to the brokenness of the world. A broken man is brought before Jesus and all the Pharisees want to do is they want to talk about the law and whether or not it would be right or wrong for Jesus to to heal this man. And Jesus said, absolutely, I'm going to heal him because that's what Jesus Christ came to do he came as the king of his kingdom and his kingdom is one that brings healing to the brokenness of this world in this event this moment where Jesus heals this man is going to give us a very powerful and important principle about God's kingdom and so Jesus told a story to illustrate the principle let's look at verse 8 as he continues when you were invited by someone to a wedding feast do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him and he who invited you both will come and say to you give your place to this person and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place but when you are invited go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes he may say to you friend move up higher then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you I made a big mistake one time at a wedding reception, and maybe you've done this as well. I actually sat down at a table that was reserved for the bridal party. Anybody else ever had that wonderful experience? So I walked into the banquet room. It's beautiful, you know, great. You know, the fine china's out, and they've got water poured. There's some tea in the glass, and so I sit down. I put my sweet and low into the tea, and I start drinking and drinking the water, and then someone has to come up to me and say, hey, this is for the bridal party. We need you to move. Do I take the tea with me? <laughs> Can you imagine? Imagine your Christmas party at your, at your corporate event. 
And you come into this corporate party and you're like, hey, this is great. There's food everywhere. There's this great feast. Everybody's having a lot of fun. And then you go sit down at a table and then the CEO of the company comes up to you and says, hey, this is for the CFO and all the VPs and you ain't one of them. Get up and move. Can I take the tea with me? Right? I mean, can you imagine how, how horrible would that would be? How many of you have seen the movie A Beautiful Mind about John Nash at Princeton? It's a, it's a fantastic movie. But there's this scene, and, and I actually had to look it up because I wasn't sure if it was true. This is completely fabricated. This did not actually happen. But in the movie, John Nash at one point, John Nash is dealing with schizophrenia. He has a disability, and, and that's what he dealt with. And so there was some, some people that really didn't want to accept him. And so in the movie, there's a certain dining hall where all of the professors who had been accepted into the, math, uh, the mathematics department would sit but the only way that you could get inside was you had to be invited inside. So there's one scene in the movie where John Nash is walking by and someone says, well, why don't you go back, go inside? And he's like, no, 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 no. No way I would go in there. Because he knew you don't go in there if you're not invited. Then later on in the movie, something happens. And I, I, we have the video clip of this. I want you to see what happens in the movie. The image of the Nobel is... Oh, I see. So you came here to find out if I was crazy find out if I would screw everything up if I actually won. Dance around the podium, strip naked and squawk like a chicken, things of this nature. <laughs> Something like that, yes. <laughs> would I embarrass you? Yes, it is possible. You see, I... I am crazy. I take the newer medications. But I still see things that are not here. I just choose not to acknowledge them. Like a diet of the mind, I choose not to indulge certain appetites. Like my appetite for patterns. Perhaps my appetite to imagine and to dream. Professor Nash. It's good to have you here, John. Okay. It's an honor, sir. Thank you very much. A privilege, Professor. Professor. So in the movie, the professors, when they would accept someone, would walk up to them at that table and they would put their pen down as a sign that they had been accepted. It's a very powerful moment in the movie where John Nash, who has dealt with the schizophrenia, finally feels like he has been accepted by the members of this faculty. Imagine how powerful that scene would have been the other way if John Nash, the first time he thought he could go in or someone told him to go in, he went in, sat down at the table, and rather than placing the pins on the table saying, now you're accepted, they said, hey, you're not welcome here, get out. You see, G Jesus told the Pharisees after healing this man, he said, listen, when you're invited to a party, don't sit in the place of honor where the host might have to come to you and say, hey, that's for someone else that's more dignified than you. Instead, he said, pick the lowest place, and then perhaps the host would come and invite you to a place of honor and dignity. And he told that story, he gave that instruction to illustrate the principle of the kingdom that I want to point out to you in, in Luke chapter 14 and verse 11. He said this, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be what? Exalted. Here's the principle. Humility is the catalyst for the growth in God's kingdom. Humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. Why did Jesus tell this story? Why did Jesus tell these 
uh, Pharisees this? Why did he give them this instruction? And why did he heal this man? Well, if you look at verse 7, Jesus did it because verse 7 tells us that Jesus told this story because he noticed how they chose the places of honor at the parties. The Pharisees would come in with their robes when they were invited to to dine somewhere, and rather than sit at the lowest table, they felt like they deserved to sit at the highest table. And that's why Jesus told them this story and then gave them the principle of the kingdom. You see, in the kingdom of the world, in the kingdom that we live in on this world, the rule of this kingdom is promote yourself. Look out for who? Look out for number one. Look out for you first. Exalt yourself. Market your brand. Because that's the way that you get ahead, right? I mean, you kind of climb the corporate ladder, you step on someone else on the way up. It's always look out for yourself. I I shared this with Jonathan. I was really excited about this joke I'm about to tell you, okay? Really excited. This is going to be really good. You see, Facebook is proof that this world, this kingdom, is selfish. Because we only take selfies, we don't call them otherzies. Huh? Man, I thought that would be better. Right? Hey, let's take an other Z. No. Let's take a selfie, right? And let's put the camera at an angle that makes you look weird and makes everyone like we can't see your arm, you know? (laughs) Or let's stand in front of a mirror. We can see your phone when you're snapping the shot. Aren't selfies kind of weird to you? But that's the way of the world. That's the world that we live in. It's all about you. You promote yourself. You promote your brand. And that's why you have all these athletes when they get in trouble. They have to get up and apologize. I think sometimes it's not because they're really sorry, but they're worried about their image and the way that it will affect their pocketbook. Because the only way that you get ahead in the kingdom of this world is you sit down at the highest table first. But the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, humility is the key or the catalyst for kingdom growth. And so Jesus told two stories to then illustrate this principle. And I want to start with the second one in verse 16. We're going to come back to the other one in a moment. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Now, before we read the rest of the story, I want to take you back to English class for a moment. What's the first word of verse 16? What kind of word is that grammatically? Who remembers? It's a conjunction. And the word but is a word that shows that what is about to follow is in contrast with what was just said or what just happened in verse 15. So look back in verse 15. Jesus telling the story that we're going to share in a moment. A man at the table said, well, blessed is the man who eats bread in the kingdom of heaven. And that sounds like a good statement, right? I mean, we see the analogy that any person who eats at the table of the king is blessed. And we'd say, yeah, that's good. But Jesus said in verse 16, but you need to understand something about the kingdom. Let's continue. Let's read verse 16 again. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first said, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I'm in prison. Oh wait, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, listen to this, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges, and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. In verse 16, the great banquet that Jesus is talking about in the parable is the banquet of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus had prepared. And then Jesus extends this invitation. And even after people had been invited at the banquet, yet there is still more room. Do you see it in verse 22? There's still more room for people to come. And the man who invites people to the feast wants everyone to come. He said, go out and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. What Jesus was saying is simple. 
I have created a feast. The feast is the kingdom of heaven where God brings healing to brokenness. I want you to go and I want you to bring as many people in. There's still room at the table for those who would come in to be healed. The desire of God is that every person in their brokenness would be healed. But those who were invited, verse 24 says, they missed the feast. They had been invited to feast at the table of the kingdom of God, but some people missed it. Did you hear why? When the servant went to those people and he said, hey, the king has the feast ready. Come in. Everything's ready. Did you hear why they missed it? The first one said, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. The second one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I, can, I, and I go to examine them so I can't come. Please have me excused. And the third one said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Did you hear the word that was repeated? I, 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 I. Do you know why people won't accept God's invitation to the feast? Their pride. I've got something else that I've got to do. I've got something else that's a higher priority. They missed the kingdom because they were too interested in themselves. They were too interested in living their lives. Remember a few weeks ago I talked about, if you weren't here, Jesus said no one that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And the reason people put their hand to the plow and they say, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever, I, wherever you lead me, but they start looking back is because there's something behind them, something that they feel like they're going to miss out on if they follow Jesus completely. And these people who were invited to the feast, it wasn't like they were an unwanted guest. Jesus had invited them to come, but they missed it because they were too selfish. They missed it because of their pride. And the same could be true for you. Maybe you've been missing out on God's kingdom because you're too interested in living your life the way that you want to live it. And God is offering a feast, a feast of mercy and grace and peace but you're so interested in your job, you're so interested in your kids and your family and your money, your bank account, your car, that you've completely missed out on everything that God is inviting you to. Humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. You will never accept the invitation into God's kingdom until you humble yourself before God. And that is so difficult for us. It was difficult for these three people. And don't you hear your voice in there? God, I would serve you today, but first I need to what? God, I would do more for you, but I just don't have what? God, I would live for you, but, but first I need to what? God is saying there's a feast waiting for you. But humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. So many people never become a child of God because they will not humble themselves before God. Notice what Jesus said later in verse 33 of Luke 14. He said, Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Imagine being a Pharisee at that party. Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath when you didn't think he should. Jesus saying when you go to a party, don't sit at the highest place, sit at the lowest place. And don't be like these people who rejected the invitation of the kingdom. You need to renounce everything and follow completely after Jesus Christ. And we say to Jesus at that moment, I'll renounce almost everything. Or I'll renounce some of it. But Jesus says, if you don't renounce it all, you can't be my disciple. Because Jesus knew that if we don't renounce everything to follow Him, your desire at some point will supersede God's desire for your life. Your vision for your kingdom will trump God's desire and God's vision for His kingdom. Answering the call to the kingdom, it requires humility. Listen, you will never sit down at the feast of the King unless you humble yourself before Him. Unless you acknowledge that you have sinned before God 
and that you needed someone to rescue you from your sins. That one is Jesus. And until you humble yourself before the cross of Jesus and put your life in the hands of Jesus and say in your heart, if I have any hope for heaven, it's because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for me. Until you humble yourself before Jesus for salvation and you humble yourself before Him to surrender completely to Him, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus. And it's a hard teaching, but when you look at the blessing of the kingdom, it's worth it. Humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. Now let's look at the second parable, parable, excuse me, beginning in verse 12, which is actually the first one that Jesus told. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be, excuse me, and in return, excuse me, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When I was growing up, I, I was raised in church. If you don't know my story, my dad was a pastor, and we had this one guy at our church growing up. His name was Jim Stark, and wonderful man, and very godly man, loved Jesus with all of his heart, and Sometimes when he would pray, he would say something. As a kid, I'd listen to it. Kerry probably heard him say it sometimes. He would say, Lord, just, just make our church a lighthouse. You know, and you'd hear people, if you've been around church any length of time, you've probably heard that, that statement. And what they're saying is they, he wanted the church to shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world. But let me tell you something about lighthouses. Lighthouses warn people about danger. They stand on the shore. If you've ever seen one, they have a light at the top and it just spins around, right? But let me ask you this question. What good does a lighthouse do for someone whose boat has capsized in the ocean? Hey, the land's over here. But what, what good does that lighthouse do for someone who's out in the ocean and they can never swim the shore? Their boat has completely capsized. And yes, I think the church is here to shine the light of the kingdom, to invite people to come to the feast. To invite the poor and the lame and the crippled and the blind, just like Jesus said. But we're not just to stand on the shore and say, hey, we've got Jesus and everything over here is okay and shine the light and say, you need Him too. No, what we need to do is get out of a lighthouse mentality and get in the lifeboat and go out and rescue them. Do you see the difference? A lifeboat sees people who are drowning and says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get you. If you saw the movie Titanic and if you read history, remember that when people were in the lifeboats and they were pushed away from the Titanic before it came down? Only one boat remained, excuse me, only one boat returned to find victims who were still alive in the water. Why is that? Because everyone that was already in the lifeboat, they were only concerned about themselves. And maybe that's you. You see, you not only have to have humility to accept the call into the kingdom, but you also have to have humility to invite other people to the kingdom. Jesus said, when you invite someone to your house, don't invite a rich person who can repay you and scratch your back as well. Go out and find the people who are drowning, who are broken. And go out and bring them to the feast knowing that they can never repay you. They could never scratch your back. Go out and find them and invite them to the feast so that on the day you stand before God and give an account of your life, God will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Who cares about what people can give you on the earth? Get in the lifeboat tomorrow when you go to work. And go into your office and find someone who needs Christ and invite them to come. Go to your school tomorrow for those who are starting school and invite someone to get in the boat with you and come to Christ. Humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. The kingdom of heaven is for the rich and it's for the poor. The kingdom of heaven is for those who can see and for those who cannot. The kingdom of heaven is for those who can walk and those who can't. 
the kingdom of heaven and the feast of God's kingdom has been prepared for everyone. So if Jesus were asked that question, if you could have anyone, dinner with anyone, Jesus, who would it be? Do you see God's answer? Jesus prepared a feast. And it was the feast of His mercy and grace that is found in the healing embrace of the kingdom. And Jesus, by telling these parables, said that those who were invited to the feast are the poor and the crippled, the lame, the blind, the sick, the hurting, and the broken. Jesus would say, every single mom who's struggling as a single mom is welcome at this table. Every person who has battled addictions, I've prepared a feast for you. Every person whose marriage is broken, come sit at my table. The kingdom of heaven has been prepared by God, not for those who have everything together, but for those who are completely broken. You see, Jesus, if he could have dinner with anyone in the world, he'd pick you. He'd pick every person in this room and He would compel you to come and say, hey, I want you to sit down and I want you to eat at my table. And as verse 15 affirms, when you in humility respond to the call of the kingdom, you are blessed when you eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. It may not be what you thought it was, You may have thought it was for the rich or for all the people that had everything together, but Jesus said it's blessed to eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. I heard a story one time. I I brought something with me. I meant to have it on the platform. I heard the story of a a boy, a young man, and he graduated high school and and, uh, saved up his money working. He saved up his money to go with his friends on a cruise. So he bought his tickets to the cruise ship and He got on the cruise and was really excited about going out to the ocean, going to the beach, and seeing all the the different places he was going to go. And he brought on on the cruise ship a big box of crackers, a bunch of crackers. And so he'd walk around the the cruise ship, he'd just eat his crackers. And he'd watch all the people at the the buffet lines and at the places where there was food, and people were offering him drinks. They They would sit down and his friends would say, hey man, why don't you eat with us? He's like, no, man, I'm good. I got my crackers. And he just ate crackers the whole cruise. Five days. And everywhere he went, he had crackers. And he would look at the food, and he'd say, man, that looks amazing. And his friend's like, man, eat. Get your plate. He's like, no, man, I'm good. I got some crackers. And his friends would look and say, oh, dude, you're sitting there eating those crackers, and you're missing out on all this food. Just order a plate. Go up to that buffet line. Get, get fat with all of us. No, man, I'm good. I got my crackers. Mmm. So as they were disembarking the cruise ship, his friend said, hey, man, I'm, I've been confused all week by you. You know, you, you buy this cruise, you spend all this money, and then you come on the cruise ship and you didn't eat anything on the cruise ship except crackers. He turned to his friend. He said, man, I know. But I had saved up all my money for the cruise. And when I got on the ship, I I couldn't afford any other food, so I had to bring crackers with me. And his friend's like, what are you talking about, man? Don't you know that when you buy the cruise, the food is included? And the young boy just dropped the crackers, and he's like, you're kidding me. (laughs) Now, of course, it's probably not a true story. But I think it illustrates a point very well. There are so many people, and maybe people in this room today, who've just been walking through life, and you think that the best thing that there is, it's the crackers you're eating. And God has said, I've placed a feast before you. All I want you to do is come and sit down and eat at the table of my kingdom. And I want you to taste grace and mercy and peace with God. You have a decision today. Am I going to continue to just walk around eating my crackers? Or today, will you humble yourself before God and say, God, I'll follow you for the rest of my life? C.S. Lewis said it like this, 
think we have the quote on the screen. He said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And maybe you've missed the kingdom of God because you've been nibbling at the crackers of the world, thinking that it will ultimately satisfy. Jesus says to you, I want you to come and eat at my table. If there's never been a point in your life where in your heart you recognize your sinfulness before God, that you've done wrong before God, and that you had no hope for heaven other than Jesus Christ rescuing you, I want you to understand today that Jesus Christ loved you. He loved you by preparing a feast of His kingdom. He invites you into His kingdom. But He says to you, there's only one door. There's only one way. And you have to come the way that I invite you in. And that way is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day so that you could experience the joy and the life that He offers. And if you've accepted that, if you in your heart have believed that gospel, you can sit down at the table. But then Jesus says, get up, and I want you to go out, and I want you to compel others to come. Humility is the catalyst for kingdom growth. So today in your heart, will you humble yourself before God? And will you say in your heart, today I believe that Jesus died for me. Will you sit down at the table and experience the joy of knowing Christ? And as a follower of Jesus, today will you make one commitment that over the next two weeks, before the week after Labor Day, that you will pray and ask God to bring someone to your heart and mind that you know is broken. Someone that you know needs to sit down at this table. And will you invite them to dinner? Will you invite them to coffee? Will you go out of your way this week or the next week to say to someone who needs Christ, I want to invite you to come and to sit at this table. I want to invite you to the feast of the King. I'm going to pray And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, while I'm praying, I'm going to ask you to pray as well that God would bring someone to your mind that you need to invite to this table. And if you're not a follower of Christ, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, when I'm praying, I'm going to ask you in your heart to put your faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross for your salvation. Let's bow for prayer.